Amen. Well, why don't we tell a little story and then we'll just jump into the gospel. Is that a deal? All right, so a few weeks ago when we were in the middle of our Acts series, I was just praying in this room and I made my way back to section 303, just a few rows from the very back wall. And as I was praying over that particular row of seats, I hit one seat and I said, God, that you would make a distinction among us. And when I said that phrase, I knew that wasn't really one of my particular phrases. It wasn't something that I pray all the time. Maybe I've never prayed that phrase. I don't know, but when I said it, I knew that was a gospel word. But I didn't know exactly where it was. And so whenever you don't know where something is in the gospel, I did what everyone else would do. I went and I Googled it. (laughs) God, that you would make a distinction. And it popped up this text in Exodus where it speaks of God making a distinction among his people. There are those prayers that you will pray that are good prayers. And you may pray them every single day. But there are also those prayers that when you pray something, something about that prayer in that moment, there was was just a, there was a spark on that particular word. And when you have your prayer time, when you pray, when there tends to be, when there happens to be a moment where there's just a spark on a phrase, pause on that phrase and make sure you understand what God is speaking through you. Make sure you understand what you are praying for because in that moment, God wants to speak to you. He wants to build faith in you so that you can actually trust him to do exactly what you just asked him to do. And so in studying that word, here is essentially where we're going to go today. Open your Bibles to Exodus chapter 11 and beginning at verse 6. It says, there shall be a great cry throughout all the land of Egypt, such as there has never been, nor ever will be again. But not a dog shall growl against any of the people of Israel either man or beast, that you may know that the Lord makes a distinction between Egypt and Israel. Not even a dog will growl against you. That is, that's a peculiar promise. I have a tendency to work out late and then I go for long walks and usually I go pretty late for those as well. And when I leave my house about... I don't know, a quarter to a half a mile away, just about the time I have to get into my own head where it's just dark and quiet. There's a house that has a fenced inside yard and there's an Airedale Terrier in that yard (laughs) that yells at me every night. He just hits the fence just barking and it's always, I'm right there like I'm just in the moment of peacefulness and I'm just startled. It scares me every single time. Every single time he scares me. I walk my dog. We walk past that same fence. That same Airedale Terrier runs out, yells at me, yells at my dog. My wife and I, we walk by that same yard. That dog yells at me. He yells at my wife. He yells at my dog. If the Catholics are right and dogs go to heaven, that one's not going to heaven. (laughs) He's not going to make it. There's no way that dog's making it. But he barks at us. He yells at us. There's a promise that says, not even a dog will growl at you. By the way, my dog is still alive. He actually lived. He, we had a little bit of a, um, we had a catastrophe at Easter. The day before Easter, we had all gone and forgotten to put the dog up. And the dog's pretty smart, so it opened up one of the doors in the house and another door and another door and another door, and it found the Easter candy. The dog found the Easter candy and ate about 4,000 calories of chocolate. So I did what I do every night when the dog does something dumb like this. I put the dog up, I shut the cage, and I said, well, if you don't make it till tomorrow, it's been good. And then I walk out. And the next morning, there he is. She's just as happy as she ever was. But my dog gets growled at by that dog. 
I get growled at by that dog. My family gets growled at by that dog. But the children of Israel had a promise that not even a dog would growl at them. Because God was going to make a distinction between his people and those who do not follow him. And so this has been my prayer for you now for weeks. That God will make a distinction between you and those who do not follow him. That has been my prayer over this house. That God will make a distinction between this house and those houses that don't believe him to do the things that we are believing him to do. That we will actually see what God has promised us that we will see. So let's do this. Let's just kind of go through this brief history of distinction so that we can understand if the same promise that he promised to them, if the prayer that he made over them, if we can even actually pray these prayers over us. So if we looked at Galatians chapter 4 and verse 22, we, we see this event. It says Abraham had two sons, one from a slave woman and one by a free woman. Two kids, two promises. And it says that this should be interpreted allegorically, meaning it represents something. And he said, these two women are two covenants. And you, brothers, like Isaac, are children of promise. Now that is a unique reality because in the flesh, we were not children of promise. We weren't actually born of the family that in this text says was the family born of a free woman. We were born of the slave woman, but it says to us that we are like the child of the free woman, that we are children of promise. So something changed in the distinction. Something changed in what would determine that this person was a child of God and this person was not a child of God. We see the shift in this text, if we went all around it, is what we all know. That Jesus Christ came to seek and save the lost. That those who were far from him, that those who hadn't been born in the right family, that those who were not born on the right side of the tracks, that those nations, that those families would be saved through him so that all the promises that God made to his followers, that those same promises would apply to us. That the promises of God were now to all who would follow him. We see this maybe a little bit clearer in Romans chapter 12 and verse 10. He says, for there is no distinction between Jew and Greek. For the same Lord is Lord of all, bestowing his riches upon all who call on him. So the distinction now is no longer a national boundary or barrier. The distinction is is that we would have faith in God. And so for those who have faith in God, there is the promise of God's riches being bestowed on us. This was the promise that has been made to every generation of follower of God from Genesis to Revelation. Now those of us who were not included in the promise though, through Jesus, were included in the promise. And it's not just a few people selected out of the nations or just a few nations outside of the original Jewish nation, but rather he says the distinction is upon all who call on him. So he puts the choice of being distinct on you, that you make the choice to follow him. And if you make the choice to follow, to call upon him, then he will make a distinction between you and those who do not. We see a promise in Malachi chapter 3 and verse 18. The prophet says by the Spirit of God, once more you shall see a distinction between the righteous and the wicked, between those who serve God and those who do not serve him. Now let me take a quick side note, because I think sometimes, especially in our generation, we have this um, conflict with distinctions. We don't necessarily like that there are consequences that happen after bad decisions. 
we don't like to embrace that there are actually rewards for good decisions. We have come into this sort of almost concept of fatalism where we feel like my life is just destined to be this way and it's not destined to be that way and so I just have to live with what I have because this is what God wants for me. The, the misery that might surround me or the frustration that I keep stepping into, this is just God's will for my life. And this person over here, the, these people on my social feeds, man, they, God, God ordained a great life for them. He ordained a great life for all of them, but he ordained kind of a, just a life of suffering for me. And we have this sense that the distinction doesn't include us. And then it also gives us sort of a self-righteousness that when somebody steps into a reward that God has for them, that they had to do it the wrong way. And so I, I just want to embrace, if we could, at least for the next 30 minutes, that God has a distinction for you that is good. That God will actually distinguish between your house and the houses that do not serve him. And he will actually make a distinction between this house, our church, and then places that do not want what it is that we want in this house. That we actually get to choose to serve him. And by the choice of service that he makes a distinction upon us. Amen. And so um, let's, let's look at it from Peter's perspective by the inspiration of the Spirit. In 1 Peter chapter 2 and verse 8, he said, They stumble because they do not obey the word of God as they were destined to do. But you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation that you are God's own possession, that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who has called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Now let's deal with the first part of that conversation of stumbling. They stumble because they disobey the word as they were destined to do. Is that saying that they were destined to disobey the word of God. No. It's saying they were destined to stumble. Who was destined to stumble? Anybody who disobeys the word of God. The choice to obey the word or to disobey the word has been given to you. You have been given that choice to obey or to disobey. But if you choose to disobey, then there is a destiny of stumbling for you that God has ordained. What that means is God said this path is the wrong road and on the wrong road there will be a life of stumbling. This path is the right path and on the right path there will be a life of blessing. You choose whether you obey him and walk on this road or you disobey him and walk on this road. You make that choice. He chooses how this road ends and he chooses how this road ends. That's God's choice. You don't get to choose what's wrong, and you don't get to choose where wrong leads you. You don't get to choose what is right, and you don't get to choose where right leads you. What you get to choose is whether you will obey right or whether you will obey wrong. That's your choice. We have the choice to follow or to not follow, to obey or to disobey. But the riches are bestowed upon those who call on him. There is a blessing upon those who serve the Lord. There is a distinction that is made between the righteous and the unrighteous, between those who serve God and those who do not serve God. There is a predestined path of stumbling for whoever chooses to disobey the word. But there is a predestined road of blessing for everyone who chooses to follow God. So if you have something in your life where there is stumbling, don't take and look at it and say, well, God chose me for this life of stumbling. No, no. He chose that miserable pathway to end in stumbling. But he gave you the choice to choose blessing. Choose you this day who you're going to serve. This is what Joshua said. He looked at the entire group of people and he said, you make the choice who you're going to serve. Either you're going to serve God or you're going to serve the gods of the nations where we're stepping into. But as for me and my house, 
we will serve the Lord. And those who serve the Lord, God says, I'm going to make a distinction between you and between those who do not. So this chosen race is not a chosen generation or a chosen race based on where you were born or based on your last name. It is based on do you have faith in God to receive the grace that he's promised to everyone who will have faith in him. This began to be a conversation in the early church. Peter, when he wrote these words in 1 Peter, they began to have questions about them by 2 Peter. And he had to answer these questions to clarify some things, even questions that we still have today and clarifications that are still necessary today. In theological circles today, there are people who believe that Jesus did not die for everyone, but he died for some. The act of Jesus dying for you and paying the price for your sins is what we call the atonement. That is the atonement. They say the atonement is limited. If the word limited atonement has ever been in a theological conversation that you have had, that theology is actually wrong. It's incorrect. Jesus died for all. So they, when they saw that this road of stumbling was their destiny, they began to have questions. And so Peter had to clear it up and said, no, 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 the path is the predestined stumbling, not the person. And then he talked about these people in 2 Peter chapter 2, uh, verse 1. He said, there were people who are false prophets. There are people who teach false things. There are people who try to distract you and dissuade you from true faith. He said, of them, they deny their master, they deny Jesus, who bought them. So he's saying that the true prophet or the false prophet, that Jesus actually paid the price for both of them to serve him. But the true prophet determined to serve him. The false prophet determined to disobey him. He said, Jesus bought them. They denied their master, though he bought them, and they choose for themselves a swift destruction who chose the destruction they did did they have an opportunity to make a different choice yes because Jesus bought them just like Jesus bought you but even though Jesus bought them they deny him they make the wrong choice and bring upon swift destruction on themselves so let's go back to first Peter so you are chosen what makes you chosen that you stepped on the road that he said is going to lead to blessing you said I'll receive that I'll be who you called me to be, a chosen race. And then he said a royal priesthood. Now that's a beautiful picture. He's quoting this actually out of Exodus. Peter's quoting this promise out of Exodus. He's just bringing it into the new covenant for those who would have faith in God through Jesus Christ. But there's this picture in Exodus when the children of God were in the middle of a battle. They were fighting with Amalek. And in this battle, Moses stepped forward and he would hold the staff high. And when he held his staff high the children of Israel would start winning the battle. And as soon as he brought the staff down, the children of Israel would begin to lose the battle. And so there were two people that assisted Moses in holding the staff up. And it was his brother Aaron, and it was this man named Hur. Now, Aaron was from the tribe of Levi. They were the priests. Hur was from the tribe of Judah. They were the rulers. And so in this moment, we see the picture of a kingdom of priests. And in this picture of the kingdom of priests, we see the promises for the children of God that victory is ours. So you are a chosen race. You are a royal priesthood. There are wins for the royal priesthood. You get to win the battle. And then he said, you're a holy nation. Now, holiness is, it can be a mixed bag for some. Because Jesus paid it all, and when you have faith in him, he makes you holy. But then when he makes you holy, he calls you to be holy. In other words, to walk in holiness. And this is, this is where sometimes, uh, for whatever reason, in Christian culture today, this is a conversation we really have difficulty embracing. It's like we, we want to embrace that we're part of the family, but then we get tripped up with the idea that if we don't live according to the gospel of God, we're not going to have the promises that he made us. We, we think we should just get the promise anyhow. Like whether I did the work or not, I should get the A. That, that's the equivalent. Whether I show up to work or not, I should get the paycheck. 
So you, you got the job, congratulations. You got the uniform. You get to wear the little yellow M on your shirt. You're on the team, man. And then you show up and you do nothing. Are you on the team? Until you went to class. You're, you're enrolled in school. Like, good for you. They let you come on in. You show up to SEU every Monday at 8 o'clock. You go sit in class. You put your earbuds in. You listen to everything else. And you do nothing. Are you going to receive the reward? Like, that's the question. Did they make you part of the team? Yes, they made you part of the team. But now that you're on the team, what are you doing? And this is where we like lose our minds. So Paul, by the inspiration of the Spirit, decided to clear this up for us in 2 Corinthians chapter 6 and verse 14. To everyone who had these questions, he said, let me ask you something. What partnership does righteousness have with lawlessness? If we're talking about a distinction between the righteous and the lawless, we need to make sure we understand what that means. Because we're going to get into the distinction. The distinction's pretty awesome, but we need to make sure we qualify first. What partnership does righteousness have with lawlessness? God said, I will make my dwelling among them, and I will walk among them, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. Therefore, go out from among the world and be separate from the world. And I will be your father and you shall be sons and daughters to me, declares the Lord Almighty. Now the Apostle Paul asked a question. What partnership does righteousness have with lawlessness? And then he goes back to the Old Testament and he takes a promise that was made to them that there would be a distinction made among them. And he takes that promise and he brings it into the new covenant and he sets it in the middle of the church. And he says, you, the church, have no partnership with lawlessness if you're righteous. And because you're righteous, now this promise that God made to you way back in the old covenant, now is the moment where it applies. He's going to walk among you. He's going to be your God. He's going to be your people. You were not his people. He was not your God. But because of faith in Jesus, now he says, I will be your God and you will be my people. So he sets the prophecy right there. And then he moves on in chapter 7 and verse 1. Right? Right? We just put the chapter marks in. It's all the same promise. It all just keeps connecting. He just keeps right on moving. And he says, since we have these promises, that is the promise that God will be a father to you and that he will be your God. Since we have these promises, let us cleanse ourselves from every defilement of body and spirit, bringing holiness to completion in the fear of God. Ah. the fear of God um, I don't know that we have a lot anymore I mean people we, we just sometimes live like idiots and then we just come skipping to Jesus hey good to see you Jesus how you doing man what's going on I'm thinking if I'm going get to get in the presence of Jesus like I'm just like this I don't know that I, hold, I dig the whole Jesus is my boyfriend lifestyle. Like, I, don't, I, don't, I, don't, I don't know that I get that. I don't know that I get this whole, this casual relationship that we have with Jesus. Like, I get it. We are children of God. He is the son of God. He says, I call you friends. I'm there. But... He also calls us servants. And at the end of the day, there's only one who's worthy to open the scroll. At the end of the day, I mean, you go read the book of Revelation for yourself. But when they say who's worthy, it's just Jesus that steps up to the scroll. He doesn't look at us and say, hey, guys, come on, help me open this. Come on. Come on. You know, I'll tear it here and you tear it the rest of the way. 
I think we have to be careful. I think we need to pay attention. The language is clear. You cleanse yourself and you bring holiness to completion in the fear of God. When you fear God, you'll bring holiness to completion. When you don't fear God, you'll skip around sin and just dance around a golden calf and then run up to Jesus and say, hey, how's it going? If I'm dancing around a golden calf, I'm definitely not skipping up to Jesus. So I'm, I'm just, I just want to make sure that we understand there is a distinction between the righteous and lawlessness. But the righteous, that's not a definition for people who are lawless that claim Jesus. That's not the definition of righteous. I just make sure we all get that. The righteous are those whom he has made righteous. We called upon him. And we what? We serve him. That's, that is, we are righteous and we do works of righteousness. We are holy and we bring holiness to completion. We are sanctified and we are being sanctified. We are saved and we are being saved. It is a condition and it is a process. And it's all wrapped up in one. And we have to understand that. Or there will be no distinction made. Because we will not find ourselves on the side of the righteous where God makes a distinction and we experience all the blessing and the riches that he bestows on us. You cleanse yourself, bringing holiness to completion. You consecrate yourself. You choose this day. And then he will make a distinction between you and between those who don't. Now let's, let's look at what that distinction was. We see the first distinction was made in the place where they dwelled. God will make a distinction between your house and the house of those who do not serve him. Exodus chapter 8 and verse 22, God said, I will go on this day and I will set apart the land of Goshen where my children dwell so that there shall be no flies there. And I, so that you will know that I am the Lord in the midst of the earth. He said, there's going to be no flies here, but there will be flies there so that you know that I'm the Lord in the midst of the earth. This is in the middle of a sequence of what had been being called plagues. When these plagues started, they affected things that affected everybody. One of the miseries of life is sometimes that when there is calamity, that, a cal that calamity affects us all. When there's bad weather, it affects us all. When there's famine, it, affect, it affected them all. The reason why they were in Egypt to begin with is because the famine that was throughout the land also affected the land of Israel, and so they came down into Egypt. There are those seasons when there are things that affect us all, but then there are also those seasons and those moments where God says, yeah, I'm going to make a distinction between those who serve me and those who don't. And this was one of those moments. He said, I'm making a distinction. There are going to be flies all over the place, but there will not be flies at your house. Now, being in Florida, I, I think... I think that would be awesome. This is not the promise, but this would be awesome if at my house, I don't care about your house for a minute. You, you keep them all. But if at my house, I could go out my front door and just leave it open and no mosquitoes would come inside. Can you imagine what that would be like? That we could look over at the neighbors and we're just, Sitting out in her bathing suit, not even doing it, not doing a thing. Just enjoying, no mosquitoes, none. This was the distinction. God said, I will make a distinction between you and between them. I'm going to make a distinction between your house and their house. But what is the distinction for our house? Like, that's the question. If the prayer is, God, you make a distinction, what is that distinction? It's peace. Yay. In Matthew chapter 10 and verse 13, Jesus said, you go up to these houses and if the house is worthy, then put your peace upon that place. But if it is not worthy, let your peace return to you. Whose peace did they have? They had Jesus' peace. Jesus said, my peace I give to you. My peace is not like what the world gives, but I give my peace. If the world gives you peace, if you have peace because the world gave it to you, then the world can take your peace away. But when Jesus gives you your peace, 
you have the peace that he gives you that abides. Lasting peace. Peace that literally goes beyond your understanding. He said it surpasses your understanding. What does that mean? That means that in the middle of chaos, I still have peace. Like I see the chaos. I hear the chaos. I understand it. I'm just at peace. And people will look at you and they'll say, how in the world can you be at peace in the middle of this? Oh, because I have Jesus. And they're like, oh, what? what? Like I have Jesus too. Don't we all have Jesus? No, no. No, not everybody on the planet has Jesus. There are those who have Jesus and serve him. And there are those people who do not have Jesus. And God makes a distinction. And I know the distinction is uncomfortable sometimes. Because it makes us aware that there are people in our families who do not have Jesus. It makes us aware that there are people at our work who do not have Jesus. It makes us aware that there are people on our road that do not have Jesus. But if you have Jesus, he makes a distinction between you and those who don't. So he promises this peace to you and upon your household. Now, let's just kind of lean into that just a minute. Because I don't know, I talk to a lot of people and it seems like sometimes we're not really experiencing peace. But I think this is why we have to tie it back into if you consecrate yourself, he'll make a distinction. If you obey the gospel of God, he'll make the distinction. What is the distinction? Peace. What's your part? That you obey God. Do you obey God in your house? That's the question. Do you obey him? Do you, husbands, do you love your wives like Jesus loves the church and gave himself for them? Like, do you show that measure of patience? Do you show that measure of communication? We had this moment in our household the other day where Ab was, she was telling me something about a pair of jeans. And um, in the moment, it was important to her. Now, I don't know if you guys can tell from Sunday to Sunday, but I mean, you know, clothes are not first on my priority. Um, I mean, you know, you get dressed and you, you go through the day, like you, you have to be presentable. But I don't, I don't like labor over it. And and it's, she doesn't labor it over, over it either. She just was having a conversation about jeans. I didn't really want to talk about jeans. I didn't understand what she was saying. It didn't make sense to me. It made sense to her. And I'm listening, and I'm like, okay. And that's what I said, okay. And she says, you know what? I'm sending you to Manners Camp this summer. <laughs> so I'm going to Manners Camp this summer. We have no idea where it is. No idea where it is, but I'm going. So if you need manners camp, we'll be there together. You and me, we'll be at manners camp. But here's the thing. Like, we, we, should, we should care about what each other care about, right? Like, if your spouse cares about something and they want to share that with you, then in that moment, it is necessary for you to be present and share that conversation with her or share that conversation with him. Don't look at me like that. It's necessary. It's necessary. Think about it. If you love your spouse, I'm just going to pick on the guys for a minute. Mother's Day's coming up. Ab can talk to the ladies in a few weeks. If you love your spouse like Jesus loves loves the church, should you not listen to her? I mean, think about your prayers. You pray some of the dumbest stuff all the time and he hears you. He listens, he hears you frantic, he knows he's got a blessing around the next curve and he's just hearing you out. Oh gee, I don't even know why. Yes, yes, yes. At least that's how I envision it, I don't know how you envision it. But the point is, he hears you. We have to hear each other. We have to listen to one another. Because here's the thing, when we are at peace, when there's peace among us, especially you parents who have kids, Like, you can can deal with the storm. Because they're not always going to listen. They're not always going to do what you ask them to do. Sometimes they do their own thing. They make their own choices. They come out of your house and they get on a school bus or they go in a classroom or they go to work or they go somewhere and they do stuff and they make their own choices. And sometimes those choices negatively impact you. You didn't make the choice. 
But their choice negatively impacts you. But in the middle of their choice that negatively impacts you, you can have peace when together you are at peace because you are following the gospel of God and he has made a distinction upon your house that your house has peace. Even in the middle of chaos, you can have peace. I couldn't raise children if I didn't have peace between my spouse and I. That would, be like the, that would be like the hardest thing ever. Like if parenting is hard enough, make it harder by being disrupted between you and your spouse. You have to work for that. There is, there's a gospel outline to experiencing peace in your home. And I am telling you, if you will consecrate yourself, if you will obey the word, he will make a distinction between those who obey and those who disobey. And the distinction will be you will have peace in your home. You will have peace. But he also says he'll make a distinction in this house. You know, not every house of God is the same. Um, let me be, I don't even know. I hope it's not offensive. Let me be as transparent. I might, maybe I'm, maybe I'm wrong. Just hear me out. Let's, let's say it. Let me offer that it's possible that I'm wrong. I doubt it very seriously, but it's possible. <laughs> Not every house of God wants the same thing. Like, you'll have people say, oh, we want the presence of God. Do you? Because you're not doing anything that it says is necessary to have the presence of God. So it's just a phrase to you. It's just a statement. Oh, we want the presence of God. Do you want the presence of God? Like Naaman. Naaman wanted to be healed from leprosy. Let's go back to the Old Testament. Naaman wanted healing. And the prophet said, okay, here's how you can have healing. Go wash in the River Jordan. He said, I, we have cleaner rivers in Syria. Why would I come all the way here and wash in the River Jordan? We don't always want to do the thing that is necessary to step into the promise. Back to my point. If you say, I want the presence of God, but you are not willing to do what the gospel prescribes in order for you to have the presence of God, then you do not want the presence of God. Because if you wanted it, you would do what was necessary to have it. What do we do to have the presence of God? It's worship. It's always been worship. It's very clear. That is the doorway, the gateway, the pathway into the presence of God. Psalm 95. I will enter into his presence with thanksgiving, with shouts of praise, with songs of joy. What is the entrance into the presence of God? Worship. That's what it is. Clap your hands, all you people. Shout unto God with a voice of triumph. Like this is how we get into the presence of God. Lift up the hands that hang down. We have been given simple instructions that walk us into the presence of God. If we are not willing to fulfill the simple instruction, we will not have the presence of God. So don't tell me you want the presence of God if you don't want worship. We don't want it. So, so. There are a lot of churches that they sing for 10 or 12 or 15 minutes because they've paid attention and they notice that for most people, it, they come in late to church and it takes 10 or 12 minutes to get into the building. So they have 10 or 12 minutes of music that is allowing people to come in and find a seat. It, the purpose of it is a prelude to the point. Let me tell you the point here. From the moment you pull into the parking lot until you leave, that's the point. That's the point. So I was at a church, First Baptist Church of Fort Lauderdale. I was there. Good people. They were very nice to me when I came in. This is not indicative of every Baptist church. This is indicative of that particular Baptist church at that time. I'm sure they're a whole lot better today. This is like 15 years ago. I walked in. Nice people. Loved Jesus. Went and found my seat in the balcony. There I am. I was in the balcony because I was underdressed. Because I was on vacation. I'm at the beach. I didn't have pants. I mean, I was wearing shorts. I wasn't in there. I didn't have, I didn't have pants. I felt like I needed pants. Whatever. So I'm up there in the balcony. And, uh, you know, you're in Fort Lauderdale. I don't know if you've been to Fort Lauderdale, but there's like some rich folks in Fort Lauderdale. And there's yachts and fancy houses, and it's like, ooh, I want one of those. You know, the Bentley drives by, and I'm like, ooh, ooh yes, sir. And so I'm up in the balcony, and they're singing, I'd rather have Jesus than silver or gold. I'd rather have Jesus than riches untold. And I just worship Jesus. 
Because in the middle of all that wealth and whatever, I'd rather have Jesus than all of it. And it was just a, it was just a worship moment in the presence of God. But as I worshiped him, I felt uh, a little uncomfortable. And so I did one of these. <laughs> and everybody's sitting around it's like this. Standing, we're standing, everybody's standing, we're all singing out of the same hymnal, and like, what are you doing? And so, you know, I'm like, oh. <laughs> Let me go back to here. Um, my section didn't want the presence of God. If they wanted the presence of God, they would be singing, they would be worshiping, they would be stepping into the presence of God. If you don't want him, don't step into his house. But if you want his presence, then step in. How do I step in? I step in through worship. Psalm chapter 63 and verse 2. David said it like this. I have looked upon you in the sanctuary and I have beheld your power and your glory. We want the glory of God in the sanctuary. The prophet Isaiah said in the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord. And he was high, and he was lifted up, and the hem of his robe filled the temple with glory. When the singers and the musicians were one, as they began to sing, the Lord is good, and his mercy endures forever, it said there was a cloud that settled in on that place so that they couldn't even get up to preach. Why? Because the glory of God had appeared. Oh, we want the glory of God in the house. How does the glory of God appear in the house of God? When God's people worship. When we worship, we step into the presence of God. And where the presence of God is, there is the fullness of everything it is that you need. That's when the riches that he has promised upon you to make a distinction between you that he bestows upon you. Why? Because you stepped into his presence. So we don't just say, God, we want your presence here. We say we want your presence, and then we turn it up to some ridiculous volume so that everybody will sing and be um, woken up to sing in the presence of God. We want to encourage you to sing. We want you to be miserable not singing. <laughs> it's true. We, we want, why? Because we want the presence of God. We want you in the presence of God. Look, 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 let me say this. It does, none of this does you any good if the presence of God isn't here. Like what good did it do you to get out of bed and get dressed and come down here if we're not going to have the presence of God? Stay home in the sheets. This, this isn't just something that we can gather a crowd so a few people can say, look at everybody that listens to us. No, it's about you being in the presence of God. It's, <laughs> that's, this is why we're here. So of course we're going to sing. Of course we're going to lift up our hands. Because when his presence falls, when Jesus was in the crowd, there was a little lady that grabbed the hem of his garment. We want his garment, his robe, to fill the temple. When she touched it, what happened? She was healed. If there's no presence, there's no power. If there's no power, there's no healing. If there's no healing, there's no transformation. If there's no transformation, what are we all praying for? We want a distinction in this house. Let people assemble. Let them sing for 12 minutes. Let them sit down. Let them hear a good message. Let them walk out and follow God and love God. We want you to follow God. We want you to love God, but we want to be in the presence of God too. We don't, we don't want just parts of this. We want all of it. Everything that God has for us. So we want a distinction in this house. I want you to be able to walk into a church that doesn't believe what we believe and you feel the difference. I do. I want you to step in there and say, eh, this isn't me. And I want you to walk right back into this house, and I want you to step into this house and say, yeah, this is what I want from Jesus. When you go on vacation and you have to go to some dead church on the corner of what and what, I want you to walk in and know, this is, bit, this is miserable. This, I want you to love your church even more. I, I want you to go, go to a dead church. I think everybody should go to a dead church once a year. <laughs> Sean, churches are dead. They're absent. Have you ever been in a dead house? You've been in a house, there's no life. Have you ever been into a church? There's no life. Go once a year. 
And suddenly that person next to you won't be so loud. I promise you, you'll, you'll welcome the noise because the noise is the entrance into the presence of God. And he said he'd make a distinction between your stuff and their stuff. In Exodus chapter 9 and verse 4, God said, I will make a distinction between the livestock of Israel and the livestock of Egypt. And nothing of all that belongs to the children of Israel shall die. Nothing. God actually promises to bless your stuff. There was a man named Laban, and he was the father-in-law of Jacob. And Jacob, the grandson of Abraham, was working for Laban. And um, Laban didn't pay very well. And there came a point where Jacob's like, yeah, I need, to, I need to be able to provide more for my family, so I need to step out and go somewhere different. And Laban said, wait, 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 what can we work out? Because I know that I'm only blessed because you're here. Like he, he said, I know that the only reason why my stuff is blessed is because you are here. Let me say this to you, saint of God. When you go to work, that place will be blessed because you are working there. We don't need to be at a place where we're like, oh, I mean, nothing's good around here. It's terrible. The boss lives like the devil. That team's awful. No, 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 no. That all might be true. Who cares? When you step into that place, because you are in that place, the blessing of the Lord will come upon that place for your sake. Because you're there, God's blessing is there. And if it ever comes to a place where God cannot bless that house anymore, he will take you and he will promote you somewhere else. He'll take you from that job into the next job. Why? Because he makes a distinction between those who love him and those who don't. Abel offered a sacrifice to God and God received his sacrifice. Cain offered a sacrifice to God. God did not receive his sacrifice and Cain was angry. And in Genesis chapter four and verse six, God says, why are you angry? Why has your face fallen? And then he goes on. He says, if you do well, would your offering not be accepted also? Why does he make a distinction? Because we give him what he asks for. When God asks for something from you, you enter into a covenant with him by giving him exactly what he asks for. And when you give him what he asks for, in Malachi, he said, I will make a distinction upon you and I will rebuke the devourer for your sake. The devourer might come and he might take away from them and he might take away from them and he might take away from them. But he cannot take away from you because God said, I rebuke the devourer for your sake. Why? Because you gave God what he asked for. You consecrated yourself to him and he said, now I'm making a distinction. Now I'm making a distinction. And finally he says, I'm going to I'll make a distinction between your prayers, how you pray, what you ask for, and what someone else asks for. We see this in Kings, when Elijah was standing in the middle of a famine, and um, all the other false prophets, false preachers, they made an altar, they sacrificed to their gods, and nothing happened. And then Elijah came up and he rebuilt the altar of God. I think some of us need to rebuild some altars. I think we've let some things get a little sloppy maybe in our homes and we're not seeing peace. It's time to rebuild the altar. We've let some things get a little bit sloppy in our faith and we haven't seen the presence of God. It's, it's time to rebuild the altar. Elijah rebuilt the altar and then he prayed. James chapter 5 and verse 16 says very clearly that the prayer of a righteous person has great power as it is working. For Elijah was a man just like we are with a nature like ours. And he prayed that it would not rain and it did not rain. He prayed fervently that it would not rain and it did not rain for three years and six months. And then he prayed again and heaven gave rain and earth bore its fruit. Why? Because the prayer of a righteous person has great power as it is working. Not just anybody. But the, the one that God says, I'm going to make a distinction between this and this. I'm going to make a distinction between here and there. 
And when Elijah prayed, it said fire came down from heaven and consumed the sacrifice. Hebrews chapter 11 and verse 4 says, By faith Abel offered to God a better sacrifice, being commended as righteous. God commending him because he accepted his sacrifice. When you give God what he wants from a lifestyle that he's asking you to live, God will make a distinction between you and everything else. This isn't just something to believe, it's something to live. That we believe this and we live this. Acts 4.31, when they were gathered together, when they were gathered together, not they, when they were gathered together, the place where they were gathered together was shaken. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and continued to speak the word of God with boldness. What are you asking God for? What are you asking God to do in your household? What are you asking God to do in your work? What are you asking God to do in your church? I believe that God will make a distinction among us. My prayer is that he makes a distinction among you, that you live in the fullness of the peace of God that he's promising for your house, that we live in the fullness of the power of God in this house, that you go from peace to power, from peace to power, from peace to power all of your days. Why? Because God is making a distinction among us. In the name of Jesus.